well since 1977. And we would be, I think we would be classified as a medium business. The small businesses are 50 million and less in sales, something like that, but we're, we're on the cusp of, of, uh, of that range in size. This is Amity Technology, we're in Fargo. We also, my brother and I also own a portion of Willard's company in Wapton. Willard's was a, a farm equipment manufacturer as well. It started in the 70s in North Dakota, moved to Wapton, and at one time, uh, in today's dollars, at one time, that business would have been probably doing 180 million in sales in today's dollars. And they, they were the leading uh, pillage manufacturer in, in the country, and they exported all over the world. They followed the Steiger tractors and the versatile tractors all over the world. Um, so that business was actually in bankruptcy in 01, and my brother and I each bought a fourth of that business and have seen uh, through the last nine years uh, ups and downs, it's, it's uh, done quite well. Our, but our own business, Amity Technology, which we're all focused on, and we have, uh, we have about, uh, 110 employees. We, over the course of the past 10 years, I think four out of those 10 years, up to 70% of our sales was export. We, we uh, have the sugar beet harvesting market. That's our, our core product. Sugar beets in the whole world are, is a small market. In North America, we have 10% of the world's sugar beet population. In the year 2000, our market was only domestic. And we, at that, in that year, we had about two thirds of the domestic market. And right now, uh, at the rate we're building machines, we could have built that entire um, year's worth of production in about two weeks. We sold 23 machines that year. And the entire market in North America was 36 machines. <laughs> I mean, so talk about a, a market that can go in sleep mode. It was, that was the one we were in. We were wondering why we're even in that business. And uh, the very next year, we exported two machines into the former Soviet Union, into um, Russia. And the following year, we sold like 35 export machines. And then the following year, we sold 160 export machines. So from the year 2000, when our total production was 23, and if we went from 23 in three years, we, we never built 101 here. We built 240 yeah. units that year. Um, but but how does this, this R&D uh, tax credit affect uh, us as a company and, and our ability to compete really on a global scale? And I, I talk much about export because, because our market being so small, it's, it's difficult to even justify spending the money on R&D for such a tiny market, knowing that it can be, uh, the absolute sales on any given year can be very tiny right here in, in, uh, in the States. But to look at the, the rest of that 90% that of the market and see how we can play in that field, um, we know that we've got to be doing things better every year. We've got to have a, a product that people want, that, that is serviceable to them, that's cost effective, and all those things that we can control, much of, much of that relates to what we're doing on the R&D side. And that, and that runs through the, uh, the engineering department. Uh, and in, in some cases, it's uh, people in the, in the field, sales, uh, people who are coming back to the company with ideas for improvement, development, and so on. And so about, let's see, I think four, four or five years ago, my, my brother's reading through the Wall Street Journal and reads an article about R&D tax credit and scratches his head. And, you know, we spent an awful lot on R&D and we're not getting in on this. 
is, is, uh, this is something we should look into. And, um, and so we, we got in, uh, hooked up with the Black Line Group, and, and since then, uh, it's really been a matter of uh, about one week out of the year, we have, we have an audit come in, uh, interviewing people within our company to see what of uh, their time, what of their supplies and so on have been spent by each individual. We, we, we get documentation of, of what's been done. And uh, that's, uh, for the past three years, it's, it's meant a pretty serious uh, amount of money for our company. We're an LLC, so our tax rate is basically whatever the personal tax rate is uh, for each of the owners. That, that's the effective tax rate of our company. So if we're at the, um, because of the company's revenues, we've been at the top tax rate. And, and if anyone, uh, if um, you look at small businesses and you look at uh, trying to gouge the, the um, let's say the top tax earners, in our case, uh, if you take any money you take away from the top tax earners, it, 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 effect, it effectively reduces the amount of money we have to play with in our business because in our business, we, we've more or less divvied out enough to the shareholders to pay taxes. That's about it because we're just reinvesting it. We're, we've been growing the business and, and um, we're, uh, we're probably wired that way. That's, that's, we enjoy doing it and that's what we, that's, that's what we like to do. But the, the, the long and the short of it is we, you know, over the last uh, 07, 08, 09, it became a state and federal uh, R&D tax credit. It's been uh, worth well over $100,000 a year to us. So it's been more than worth it to, to go through the exercise. And, and there's been some side benefits <coughs> too, um, on our, on our engineering side, we have, we have about 12 full-time engineers. And as a result of the, the interviews and projects and trying to assess what we've done, we actually now have a, a, a very workable, good voucher system for everyone who's working on engineering projects. So they're vouchering their time. And it's, it's given us a, a good management tool to, to uh, assess the effectiveness of money spent and where we to at least look back retrospectively and say, well, here's where we put all our money. Is that where we really intended to put it? And, and so now we've got a better accounting that way. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, we expect and hope that the uh, tax credit would still be there. I can't say it influences our, whether we do R&D or not, but, um, but it, to the extent that that credit's available and to the extent that our ability to compete in our marketplace, which is the whole world, is really dependent upon how sharp we are at, at having the right product at the right time uh, for our customers. And, and like on any given year, 70% of those customers can be outside the US. And um, I want to touch one thing too on, you mentioned, uh, Scott mentioned this, <coughs> not only product development, but process development. And this is something uh, uh, the guy sitting next to me and I get excited about because the industrial engineering or just how we make things is, is often overlooked in, in the States. It's we as a manufacturer, it's one thing, what we deliver to our customer is the sum total of everything that went into that product. And it's how we actually made that product is part of how competitive we can be. And I've been hands-on on, on uh, many projects within our walls of our company on improving how we convert. Our, our business does manufacturing from bringing in raw flat steel and tubes and, and whatnot. And, and we, so we do all the processes from beginning to end, the cutting and the forming and the welding, machining, painting and assembly. But coordinating all those efforts and how that work actually gets done, there's a, a lot of room for improvement.